thanks. Um, and I, I really should say it's Kubernetes. It's not Google Kubernetes at this point. It's No, I, it's not a correction. It's just I want to make it clear that we're an open source project. We have actually contributed at this point uh, the project to a foundation under the auspices of the Linux Foundation. Um, so it's really, it's out there for everyone. Um, it's There's a hosted Google version called Google Container Engine that we like to uh, think is, is a great option for a lot of people out there, but it's really an independent project. Um, so I, I'm Brendan. Um, I've been an engineer at Google for, it'll be eight years at the end of June, so it's been a long time. I started in search infrastructure. I spent a long time building uh, the back ends for search. So if you've got something out of Google that's under about 12 hours old, it came out of software that I wrote. Um, and then I transitioned to the Google Cloud Platform, and what I really got excited about there was bringing a lot of the tools and techniques and approaches that we use to make search uh, so reliable that for many people it is, Google is the test of whether the internet is working, um, to everyone. And and so that's, that's I'm gonna try to talk about how our philosophy about that and how I think that Systems like Kubernetes um, change operations. All right. So this is how this is my motivation slide. Um, I've used this a lot. So if you've been to another talk I've given, I apologize. Um, you've seen this slide before. Um, but I want I, I find that it's really emblematic in my respects about why uh, the job of operations can be really hard um, because almost no one pushes bad software. Right? I don't think. I don't think anybody knowingly goes, you know what, this is just not going to work. I'm going to push that out anyway. Um, so what happens is actually that it's the coupling that's the problem. There's unintended consequences of whatever it is that you thought you did. I mean, sometimes you just make a flat out mistake and it's a typo, but hopefully you have automation that catches that kind of stuff. More often it's some sort of like, oh, we didn't realize that making that operation twice as slow is going to crash this other system over there. Um, and so... This is the point. Most outages are self-inflicted, but most outages are also accidental. Um, and if you think about why this is, it's, it gets back to that tractor trailer, right? It's this coupled system where the thing that is providing the force is on this hinge point to the thing that is, you know, that it's trying to move, which is the trailer, and it's kind of unintuitive. Right? I actually just spent the weekend trying to help someone, well, not all of the weekend, that would be really extreme, but trying to help someone back down a boat ramp. Um, and, and we actually ended up stopping and just hand trailering the trailer, disconnecting the trailer and hand trailering the trailer down, right? It's, it's hard. This coupling makes things really, really hard and there's unintended consequences about what happens. And, and, and so I think if there's one theme that I like to put out there, and this was sort of hit on in a few places elsewhere about how, you know, physical isolation, this morning, physical isolation of teams can actually build barriers and stuff like that. Um, I want to talk about how we can build systems so that we can decouple our operations into a bunch of one-dimensional problems instead of these coupled two-dimensional problems, and as a result, make our lives easier. Right? Job is just too hard. All right, so we're going to try and break that coupling. And I, I think that this is, the, this is the breakdown that we have internally at Google, um, and I, th I think this is the breakdown that I think that we're trying to put forth to the world in general. Um, and, and I want to say each of these layers is essentially decoupled from one another, right? We have hardware SRE, um, who are basically responsible for the physical machines, imaging machines, things like that. They're, in the data, they're, the, they're the people who are in the data center. Um, if you're using an IAS provider like uh, Google Compute Engine or any of the other, or, or some sort of virtualization provider, you may have actually already opted out of this, right? Your hardware SRE already may be someone who is totally decoupled from you because you're using an infrastructure as a service company. Um, and then the next level above that is uh, kernel or OS SRE. Um, and I think that one of the things that containers have really well, one of the things that containers did for Google a long time ago and are doing for people now is enabling us to break the dependency between the, op the operating system and the application, right? I can now suddenly say, I don't need the, op the OS people to install Debian or Ubuntu or, you know, Fedora or whatever, you know, whatever the OS is that I need for this particular binary package. Suddenly, there can be one operating system across and one kernel across the entire fleet. Thousands and thousands and thousands of machines can have one operating system managed by one team. Right? That's a huge decoupling and a huge improvement in process for a lot of people. Um, the next level up is cluster SRE, um, and this is basically the people who are responsible for running a system like Kubernetes or Borg or Mesos or whatever it happens to be. Right? They're the people who sort of provide this abstract 
API that then applications live on top of. And then, of course, on top, there's application SRE. Sorry, I should say SRE. Is that a familiar term for everyone at this point? Yeah? OK, sorry. That's kind of a Google, I guess it's a Googleism. Um, so it sounds for site reliability engineer. Um, it's like DevOps before DevOps, I guess. I don't know. Um, there's a book now in O'Reilly, though, called the SRE book from Google. So you can go and read about w some of the ideas there. Um, and so application SRE, are there people who are actually, I think, I think this is actually the first place in some places where DevOps actually occurs. I mean, I, I, honestly, I don't necessarily even know what the word means. But, but I think that what it means is that the, uh, the people doing operations have deep knowledge of the applications that they are operating. Um, or, that the, or that the developers themselves actually are doing operations. Um, and I think that that's what this decoupling allows you to do, right? Because if you can focus on an application and you don't even think about kernels and you don't even think about hardware and you don't even think about really the, the, even like the cluster API, suddenly you, you have time and, and cycles to really focus on your applica the application that you're running and the application that you're, re you're responsible for. And it turns out actually, so that's what we say here, like I think this is DevOps. I should remember to move my slides forward. Um, and it turns out actually cluster SRE is DevOps too, because the cluster is an application. It's just this special application that everybody else in your infrastructure uses. Um, but it, it's just an application at some level at the end of the day. All right. Um, and I, so yes, I really did talk through my slides before I showed them. Um, and yeah. All right, I'm just going to skip ahead, catch myself back up. All right. So what I think this is the this is the thing that that cluster managers like Kubernetes enable you to do is that basically everything below that cluster layer it just vanishes, right? Just like with IAS, you got to make hardware disappear. With containers and a container cluster API, where developers are saying things like, "I want to run this image with two cores and 10 gigs of RAM," and the cluster itself is responsible for figuring out where to place it on what machine, keeping it alive, and all this kinds of thing, they can forget about operating system. They can forget about kernel. They can forget about everything below the application that they're managing. Right? And that's the, really the power of, of this higher level API, this higher level abstraction that is container oriented instead of being machine oriented. Um, and really what this allows you to do is that your machine fleet is homogenous because your developers no longer care about machines. Um, and it becomes actually this just giant sea of compute because you have a scheduler that is responsible for figuring out where to run things. And so I no longer need specific machines. I no longer need to tell my application to run on specific machines. I just express the general requirements of my application and I trust that this API, this container-oriented API, is going to be able to schedule it out. All right. Did that move forward? All right. So this is the, you know, the stuff below this line, it's the not my monkey, not my circus line, right? So this is like application owners don't actually have to care about what's going on with the operating system. They expect that you'll make the operating, the people who are operating, who are responsible for the operating system, they expect that they'll do a good job and they'll do the right thing and it'll work. But they have no other expectations, right? They have no other dependencies. This is the decoupling that we're talking about. And it turns out that it works both ways. And so... It turns out that for the people who are running the operating system, the line protects them from the application, right? I don't have to care what you're running on my system. I, don't, I, I provide everything up to this line, and it's your responsibility to provide a working application on top of that, right? So again, we're decoupling these systems so that we can move independently, so that we don't break each other, right? So that people who roll out a new kernel don't have to worry that they're going to be breaking some or more, more often rolling out a new operating system with new libcs and new, what, uh, new Python maybe, that those people don't have to worry that they're going to break some application because that application is no longer dependent on the things that those people are rolling out. This decoupling is really important for reliability. All right, so applications are going to use resources, not machines. Right? Every application just says what it needs. We scale in terms of resources. We don't scale in terms of machines. We just ask for more. Um, also important is the fact that this is an API, right? And so suddenly, the, you can introspect via an API, you can automate via an API things that are applications, right? If you're going in and you are running, you know, heaven forbid, you're running manual commands via SSH, but even if you're running scripts inside that machine, even if you're running some of these automation you know, services, 
it's very, very difficult to get an application-oriented view from automation, right? It's very difficult to write an audit log that can go across and figure out what versions of what software are running where. And that's because the APIs just don't exist, right? The APIs are, even if, you're in, even if you're in the cloud, if you're not in the cloud, then there aren't even APIs for your machines. If you're in the cloud, there's APIs for the machine, but not for the application. But with containers and with container management APIs like Kubernetes, there is actually an API for the application. And I can go and walk up to the API and I can say, how much memory is that MySQL instance using? How much CPU is my PHP script running? Right? That's hugely powerful in terms of the kinds of systems that you can build on top. Right? Suddenly, I can build a system that goes across my entire infrastructure and for every team and every group aggregates the amount of CPU that their particular applications are using. And by the way, I can difference it against the amount of CPU that they're requesting. And I can go up to teams and say, like, you know what? You asked for three times as much CPU as you ever used, even at peak. That's probably not OK. Right? This is a huge step above what normally you, you can achieve. All right. um, everything, effectively, that you're doing becomes application-oriented. I said this to someone yesterday, but one of the really important transitions that I think that containers and container management APIs is, are doing and, and are going to have, and one of the reasons why I think they effectively are taking over the world, is that the primary key for every single thing in your data center, which used to be the machine, is now the application. Logs are keyed in terms of application. Monitoring information is keyed in application. Your API is in terms of your application. Right? That's what you were thinking about anyway. You were thinking about your application. And so why should you have to think about what machine, start with a machine and go find logs on that machine? Why should you have to uh, think about health in terms of machine health? It's just not something that is relevant to your life rolling out software, which is in the end what, uh, what the job is about. All right. And so this is the real transition that I think is going on right now out there in the world. And the real reason why people are getting excited around container-oriented infrastructure is that the primary key of the data center is just shifting. And it's better for everyone. Because if I'm owning a machine, I can focus on machines and not even think about applications. There I want the primary key to be the machine because that's the thing that I manage. If I'm managing the machine, hardware, or the operating system, I want it to be. Then I decouple myself from those details when I start rolling out applications. And for everything else, where above that line of decoupling, the primary key is the application, which is the thing that you cared about anyway. And trust me, you don't want me rolling out kernels, right? Like, and I don't want, particularly want kernel people touching my application. All right, so your data center is now application-oriented. And now, hopefully that sounds a little bit cool, but it's a little bit vague. I sort of skimmed along the top and told you how you know, the world was awesome, and I didn't really talk about you know, why this was actually something that could make your life easier. Um, and so I wanted to start with some of the sort of practical, actual things that these application-oriented cluster APIs do for you, right, as an operator of an application. And the very first thing that they do is they keep your application alive, right? So we all, you know, if we've, if we've been out there and, we, and we've done reliable software for a while, we know that, like, there is... You need something to watch the system that you're running. You need something that software crashes, right? Software crashes all the time. There's lots of daemons out there that will restart your software after it crashes. Um, but they are not really very well integrated. You tend to have to make decisions. Am I going to do system D? Am I going to use supervisor D? Am I going to, like, what is, what is the way that I'm going to do this? And they tend not to have APIs, right? So I can't walk up to something and say, like, Give me the place where there's 20 restarts. Give me the application that has had 20 restarts in the last hour. Right? Or in another way, is there a difference between how many tasks are restarting on this machine versus tasks that are restarting on this other machine? Maybe that machine is sick, because everything that's on that machine is restarting constantly. Um, and so what Kubernetes and, and what other systems do for you, other systems like this do for you, is they allow you to put into the API application-oriented health checks, right? So I can actually, when I deploy something into this cluster, when I deploy a container into this cluster, I can say, you know what, I want you to hit this URL. Just go and hit this URL. If it returns a 200, then the application's healthy and it's good. If it returns anything else, restart it, right? And so instead of me worrying about installing and figuring out how to configure system D, instead of me worrying about what particular supervisor and how I'm going to get the information back, just the act of deploying into this cluster manager 
provides me with this attribute. And I think that's one of the themes you'll see. Not only does it decouple systems from one another, but it actually has this sort of generic set of primitives that you get for free just by deploying into this API. Just like with infrastructure, you expect that if your machine fails, you know, it, sorry, infrastructure as a service, cloud infrastructure as a service, if that machine fails, your machine should come back someplace else, right? It's taken over health checking your machine. Now, by moving up to this application-oriented layer, the API is taking care of health checking and maintaining your application. All right. Um, so the other thing that it allows you to do is it's actually health checking your machine, too. Sorry, that's not actually coming through very well. There's a really light gray box around each of those. Um, so this is three machines in a Kubernetes cluster, right? I have my yellow and green jobs running on one machine and two red jobs running on these other two machines. Right. So bad things happen in data centers or in infra or infrastructure as a service, and machines can fail. Right. So what happens normally when machines fail? Well, if you're lucky, you page. Right. If you're lucky, you are checking how many you know, instances of your web server you have, you see that a machine's failed, you page, and somebody comes back. But if you've been decoupled in this way, if you've stopped caring about machines and all you care about is applications, and you have a piece of infrastructure that's responsible for scheduling your application, what you will find is that the infrastructure itself actually notices that that machine has failed, and it actually moves your jobs away from that machine. Right? Because you're decoupled from the machine. You don't actually care. You just said, I want three CPUs. There's three CPUs available on that machine, and it gets scheduled there. Right? So you don't get woken up just because some machine failed. And it turns out, kernel or hardware or any kind of machine-oriented upgrade, that's just a special case of a machine failure. Right? From the perspective of your application, and you can do things like if you want to be a little bit more proactive, you can drain a machine out. You can sort of simulate a failure and drain the machine out slowly instead of you know, effectively just like slicing everything off. But it doesn't really matter from the perspective of the application. Right? From the perspective of the application, whether you restarted that machine because you wanted to upgrade the kernel or whether, you or whether that machine simply disappeared because the hard drive died, the system reacts in the same way, and your application continues to run. And so what this means is that if I'm a kernel operator, or an I'm, a, I'm an operating system operator, I don't have to talk to any of my application owners before I run an operating system upgrade. I just run it. I just go through one machine at a time, and I have an SLA, right? Like any other good decoupling layer, like any other good API, I have an SLA, and I say things like, when I run a kernel upgrade, I'm not going to restart a machine more than once every 20 minutes. Something like that, right? I have a policy around how I do these machine upgrades, but I don't talk to anybody. I don't tell anybody, like, hey, we're going to come through and upgrade the kernels. I just do it, right? And what this means is my fleet is almost entirely homogenous, which is a huge improvement in terms of uh, maintainability and also in terms of, frankly, team size, right? And, and specialization, right? I can have a team of eight that is specialized on one particular operating system, that doesn't even know anything about any other operating system, that runs fleet of machines that is hundreds of thousands of machines. Right? That's a huge win. All right. So there's something else that this does if you're thinking about machines. And the something else that it does is that if you've ever planned machine resources, or ne any resource really, network, machine, machines, CPU, whatever it happens to be, you know this problem, which is you go to the teams that are responsible in using your hardware, and you say to them, so what are you going to do? What's going to happen in the next six months? What's going to happen in the next year? And they say, team one says, we're going to double our users. It's going to be awesome. Right? And team two says, we're going to double our users. And team three says, totally going to double our users. And you know for a fact that they're probably, someone in there is either lying or mistaken, or something bad is going to happen, and it's not going to happen that every single team is going to double their use. But if you're in a world where applications are tied to machines, where applications aren't decoupled from machines, um, you really have no choice but to say, great, we're going to 3x our machines, right? Because we have, we have no ability, like, team two, they want Fedora, and team one, well, they want Ubuntu, and you know, team three, maybe they're on Windows. I don't know. Um, hopefully not. Um, but we have no choice, right? We have no choice but to, to do this because we just don't know, right? But if we decouple and we abstract and we say, like, well, the things that these teams ask for, they don't actually ask for machines. They ask for a container with a bunch of resources 
we can actually look back historically and aggregate that information and say, you know what, historically, every single team says they're going to double their users. And historically, only one team out of three ever actually doubles their users. And so we're actually only going to increase our machines by a third. And we're not going to care whether it's team one that doubled or team two that doubled or team three that doubled, because in the end, all they cared about was CPU, and so we have the CPU necessary for whoever happens. Or maybe nobody doubles. Maybe everybody goes up by 10%. It just doesn't matter, right? I be because I've decoupled my application from the machines, my planning process, I get to aggregate all your usage together. And I get to buy machines without having to worry and, and image machines. And I can just basically look at my usage day to day, week to week, and say like, oh, you know what? I'm at 80% of my machine fleet capacity. I should probably add some more machines. And I don't have to say, well, are they going to be Fedora machines or Ubuntu machines? It's like, no, they're just machines because everybody just consumes machines, right? So that ability to aggregate usage across all of your teams also is really, really important. All right. Um, so but what about application ops? I've talked a lot about hardware, and I've talked a lot about um, sort of the, s the system itself and, and how it makes managing machines easier. I wanted to talk a little bit and give some demonstrations of how this actually makes it easier for people who are running applications as well. And so that's where I'm going to jump over for the moment. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers. I have some backup slides that go through in slideware terms, but hopefully the live demo will work. Um, it is Friday the 13th, someone pointed out to me, which I hadn't, is that really true? Yeah, it hadn't occurred to me, so, you know. Um, so I have right here, hopefully everybody can at least somewhat see it, I have a little Kubernetes cluster here that's running on a stack of Raspberry Pis. It was kind of fun to build. Um, there's a couple of blog posts out there, a bunch of people have done this actually. It's kind of become the hello world of distributed computing. So if you're, uh, if you're interested, you should try it out. Um, and so hopefully we will be able to see a demo with that. I guess I'll hold it here with one screen as I move things across. The full splits. I'm also very used to like having video mirroring when I do my demo. So I'm trying not to knock my laptop off. The full like. All right. Thank you. Oh great! Then I get to type. Wow, this is going to be really super exciting. Um, <laughs> I get to type while looking at the screen. Um, all right. So I'm going to move this thing back here. I'll move this visualization over as well. Um, actually, maybe I'll just turn on the. Yeah, I blame, I really, I'm blaming people who are not me. Um, <laughs> okay, so what we have here is a visualization of our cluster. What you can see here is I have the master with Kubernetes. I'm going to hit reload so we get the current state of affairs. Um, I have the master, which is the node says Kubernetes, and then I have node one, node two, node three. Um, I have this thing called a service, which is basically a load balancer. Um, I have a replication controller, which is an object that's responsible for making sure that there are two of any one thing. Um, and then I have two instances of my HTTP application that are running there. So that's all happening right there. Um, all right, that's not going to work. Let's go over here. And so now, I'll give you the same view. I can say cube control git node. Is that visible? Can people sort of see that, or is do I need to zoom in? Let me see if I can do that. Don't even know if I can do that actually with this SSH client. Well, that's probably true. I'm hitting Control Shift Plus, but there we go. I'm too used to the OS X terminal where it's Control Shift Plus, not Control Plus. Um, all right. So there's the same picture. I've got my nodes there already, um, and I can actually say get pods, and there's my two services running. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to delete one of those. Um, actually, I'm going to say dash O wide, and you can actually see, okay, one's running on node three and one's running on node two. So I'm going to go ahead and kill one of those. So I can say cube control pods. Can you briefly explain what a node oh. and a pod is? Sorry. S sure. Yes, yes. Sorry. A node is a machine. Okay. A pod is an application. Okay. A pod is actually one or more containers running, but you can just think of it as, an, as a particular instance of an application. Yes, I apologize for that. Um, so... Yeah, a node is one of the one of one of these boards is a node. Um, okay, so I'm going to kill one of these things if I could actually breathe. Cube control. Delete. 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 Ah. It's not. 
You know, anyone who learned how to touch type? That's not me. Um, H is it one U W W T P? Okay. So let's go back over to the visualization. And I can't see my cursor. Oh, I'm never gonna do this without video mirroring again. All right, there we go. All right. So what you'll see here is we have a pod that is actually, the one that is in gray is terminating um, because I've actually asked the system to kill it. It's not entirely like a failure um, because a failure, it would just go down. Since I actually asked the system to delete it, there's actually a graceful termination period. So it actually waits 30 seconds. It gives you a signal that you're about to die and then it waits 30 seconds by default, configurable, um, to see to allow you to drain network connections, right? So the load balancer drains out the network connections, your application runs for another 30 seconds to allow you to finish whatever it is you're doing. In the meantime, it's in the midst of starting up something, that's the red one there. Um, and eventually, we get back to a situation where we have two things running, right? And so if I go back over to my uh, system here, then you can see that I have, two, I have two instances running. Again, the same uh, HTTP that was running on node two is there. The one that was running on node three is now actually running on node one, right? So again, I'm decoupled from application from machine and I just, I just don't care. And when I restarted this thing, it just happened to land on node one. Now, that's a little bit interesting, um, but we are going to do something even a little bit more interesting, hopefully, which is we're actually gonna simulate a network failure. Well, no, actually, we're not gonna we're not gonna simulate it, we're gonna have a real network failure. Um, all right, so here's my switch, my console rack switch up here, and I'm going to actually put this switch in here. Um, and so at this point, all of the nodes are health checking with one another, health checking with the master to make sure that they're actually in existence, right? And so whether it's because the machine failed or there was just a network partition, for whatever reason, the system has noticed that um, the node no longer is in existence, so we'll hit reload. And you can see there that node two has now disappeared, right? So it now knows that node two is sick. And what's gonna actually happen is not only does it know that node two is sick, it's actually gonna note that that pod that was on node two, well, it's probably not working anymore either, right? And so eventually it's gonna be just like I deleted that machine. Um, you'll see now, sorry, you'll see now that the, there's a gray one there. That's the node, that, that's the pod that's been set to terminating um, and it's actually created in another instance of the, the pod. So if we go back over to the terminal, um, I'll get pods again. And what you can see here is that uh, the thing that was on node two, well, because the machine failed, it's in the middle of terminating. It's not actually terminated because it actually can't get the signal, right? The master has actually said, hey, you're supposed to die, but because there's a, node part or there's a network partition, it actually has no idea, but it will once it comes back online. Um, and then uh, it's moved and created a new instance. In this case, it's actually running on the master. And that's another interesting point, which is that from the perspective of these applications, the thing that is the master that is in charge of this, the cluster is actually just another source of compute resources, right? It's not something special. It's just a, the place that happens to be where the components that make up the API for the cluster are running. Um, and so your jobs, as long as there's enough CPU, your jobs can schedule there as well. All right. So we'll connect the network back in, um, and we'll go back over to our visualization over here. If I can see my cursor, which I can't in the gray. All right. And we're back, and we have two things running, right? So I think th this really shows that by decoupling the application from the machine, we are, we're enabling the system to have enough flexibility that it really can react very reactively and, and responsively to a, a large number of different kinds of failures. Um, I have one minute 17 left. Um, I can end now or I can go through one more example. I don't know, if, do we wanna run over? All right, maybe we'll go back and run over. All right, so I'm gonna come back over to my terminal back here. That's that. So there's my Friday 13th network failure.
I don't know, is it better to do things like close the presentation and have the demo work, or is it better to... Uh... You can also do both at the same time. All right. Uh, sure. I just want to go through one quick moment. This is the review, in case you missed the beginning. All right. So then, so briefly, there's this concept in Kubernetes called labels. Um, and basically, a label allows you, allows you to mark different things that are running in your system, front end and production, beaver ends and testing. It allows you to query things and say, you know, I want everything that is production. This turns out to be a really powerful feature for operations. And the reason it, it's a powerful feature for operations is that I can actually do things like quarantine a server. Right? So if I've said I want to have three things running, I say, the, the way that I say I want three things running is I say I want three of front end, comma, production. Now let's suppose in the middle of the night I get paged because some server is deadlocked um, and I can't, it can't be restarted, right? What can I do in this situation? Well, normally what I would do in this situation is I would, if, if the system itself hasn't already restarted the machine or the, the task, I'm going to go in and I'm going to actually kill that thing myself because we need to get back to our production service, right? We need three, three of these things. But in Kubernetes, what we can do instead is we can actually remove this label. So we can actually say, actually, we're going to pull off that production label. This has the net effect of moving the container out of that replicated set of things. Um, a new one will be brought back in in its place, but what's important is that the old one is still out there in the cluster running, it's just not serving production traffic. And so this means that when I come in the next day or when a developer comes in the next day, they have a quarantine task that they can go in and debug that's live, that's no longer debugging from logs, it's debugging from a live server that they can poke at and hit with requests and everything else like this. It's a way, way more useful thing to have, and yet I'm still able to restore my system to full capacity without having to, uh, without having to terminate applications, right? And so again, I think this is the labels, and I don't have time to really go in and do justice to it, but again, what we've done here is we've decoupled the notion of the load balancer from specific machines, from specific applications even, we've tied the load balancer to just this abstract notion of having a, a set of labels. And by doing that, we enable behaviors that you otherwise couldn't do that enable your operations to become easier. Um, so I will be around later for questions and everything else like that. Please uh, don't hesitate to come up, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>